I have watched hours of segments about the Green New Deal, and none of them actually explained how it might work. Instead, they focused on the politics. Is it gonna pass? Does Pelosi like it? What did Trump tweet about it? Everything except, is it a good idea? Are you concerned the perception of the Democratic Party is gonna move too far to the left? Turns out there's a name for this type of news coverage. It's called tactical framing, and it's making us all too cynical to solve big problems before it's too late. This Sunday, the Democratic divide. Some progressives are pushing hard for a Green New Deal, but other Democrats worry they're being impractical. Is there a risk the Democrats maybe overplay their hand, rile up the Republican base, and you say, look, socialism, and you know some of these unrealistic yeah. uh, ideas? Tactical framing sounds like when you crop your problem areas out of a Tinder photo. Or video. Or a video. But it's actually an approach to news coverage that focuses on strategy over substance. So instead of asking, is this new policy proposal a good idea, Tactical Framing asks, is it popular? Can it pass? How will it play in the next election? The discussion is focused on the players and the implications for them and their political careers, not the policy or its capacity to solve a problem. Kathleen Hall Jameson coined the phrase tactical framing, and she argues that this obsession with strategy is making it hard for us to understand big policy ideas. Ask yourself how much of the coverage of the Green New Deal has told you what specifically is in it. Other Republicans said the plan sounded more like communist economic doctrine. You probably have no idea what the Green New Deal is. You probably have some sense that it has to do with climate, climate change, but you probably don't don't know much beyond that. It is hard to argue with her. Look at some of the headlines from the Green New Deal debate. Is the Green New Deal smart politics for Democrats? Green New Deal divides Democrats on climate change. Seven reasons Democrats won't pass a Green New Deal. We're talking about the fate of the human race here, but the focus is still on the politics. Could the fight over this plan divide the Democratic Party? Well, Republicans succeeded painting it as an unrealistic boondoggle. Notice when you're saying that, you're not asking, well, what is the problem they're trying to address? Is this a viable solution? This framing makes us less informed, but it also makes us more cynical. Jameson and her research partner ran an experiment where they gave people three different types of news stories about a Philadelphia mayoral race. Don't tune out, I will make this quick. The first group got stories that focused on the issues. What problems were the candidates trying to solve and how did they propose to fix those problems? The second group got stories that focused on tactics, how the candidates were trying to win over voters. And the third got a mix, stories that started with a tactical frame and then discussed substance. Their findings were, woof. In the second and third groups, the ones who got tactical framing, the news had activated their cynicism. They were more likely than the first group to say that the candidates were promising things they couldn't deliver or that the situation was hopeless anyway. They were also less likely to remember basic information about the policy proposals, even if what they saw included real policy analysis. We find that even with that good information there, the public's less likely to learn it because the tactical frame creates a lens on it that says they're not actually going to do it anyway. This is really all about politics. Now trust your political instincts based on your ideology. Jameson and her research. The point of political journalism should be to snap us out of our cynicism, to remind us of the magnitude of the problems we face. Most people who are thinking about their children right now, I'm sorry I'm getting emotional, but this is an emergency in this country. It's an emergency on this planet. And to teach us what our options might be. Is the new Green can. Deal going to Absolutely. solve the problem? We can't say it's too aspirational, it's the planet. That's a really important conversation. Our planet depends on it, but it's one that gets shut down every time a newsroom decides to focus on tactics. What you're seeing though, I mean, this is the pull of the 2020 Democratic primary process. I mean, this sure. is where it's headed. The Third chapter is called Global Weirding. Global Weirding, a term coined by uh, Hunter Lovins uh, here at the Rocky Mountain Institute. It's a chapter basically about what all of this global warming is going to produce, which if you heard John Holdren's talk the other day, is not this gentle sounding thing called global warming. It's going to produce global weirding. The weather is going to get weird. Uh, we're going to get hotter hots, longer droughts, heavier rains, heavier snowfalls. What I focus on in this chapter are really two points. One is philosophical and the other is uh, quite technical dealing with weather. Philosophical point is this, it came up in a discussion with uh, one of my real teachers, Nate Lewis, an energy chemist at Caltech. I was out talking to Nate um, last year and I asked him, Nate, what was it about Katrina that so bothered us? What was it about Katrina? It wasn't just the damage, there was something deeper. 
And Nate rolled that idea over in his mind for a few seconds, and he simply said, who made it hot? Who made it hot? You see, we have introduced so much CO2 into Mother Nature's operating system, we no longer know the difference between an act of God and an act of man. Did we make it hot or did he make it hot? Did we make Katrina or did he make Katrina? We, we don't know anymore. My friend Heidi Cullen, who's the one climatologist at the Weather Channel, that's a story in itself. Um, the Weather Channel has one climatologist. Always reminds me, you know, when I grew up in Minnesota back in the 50s, if we had a warm day in February in Minnesota, we said, what a gift, what a gift. Now, as Heidi said to me, we say, did we pray pay for that gift? Did we make that gift or did he make that gift? We, we don't know anymore. If you've been reading my column, you know I don't do pessimism. So um, what do we do about it? Um, basically, the transition chapter is called Green is the New Red, White, and Blue. And my feeling is, is this, and I want to read it to get exactly right, that in a world that's hot, flat, and crowded, clean power, is going to be the next great global industry. Because in time, and it's gonna be soon, the world is gonna force everyone to pay the true cost of the energy they're using, the climate change they're causing, the biodiversity loss they're triggering, the petro dictatorship they're supporting, and the energy poverty they're sustaining. These costs will either be imposed by mother nature, by individual governments, by consumers, yours or someone else's, or by your own kids who will not allow you anymore to charge their future on your visa card. Because the costs have all reached a stage of criticality where their impacts on the world can no longer be externalized, ignored, or confined. And that is why in a world that is hot, flat, and crowded, clean power generation and the tools we need for greater energy and resource efficiency are going to be the next great global industry. They simply have to be if we want our planet to remain habitable. And therefore, the ability to build, deploy, and export clean energy systems and technologies is going to become a currency of power in the energy climate era. Not the only one, but right up there with computers, microchips, and weapon systems. These green technologies will become critical in determining a country's economic standing, environmental health, energy security, and national security in the next 20 to 30 years. Some see that now, others will see it soon. Eventually, it will be obvious to all. I hope every country gets there sooner rather than later, but most of all, I want to make sure that my country, the United States of America, is in the lead. If America seizes the opportunity to solve these problems, it will be a huge engine propelling our economy in the 21st century. Right now, I don't think any politicians in America have really leveled with the American people about the scale, the in pure industrial scale of what will be required for us, what it would really take to have an emissions-free grid in this country, to have emissions-free transport fuels. It's a huge industrial project. This could be the biggest transformative concept that's come along in a, in a long, long time. It's about a Green New Deal. And I think it has a huge potential to not only reconnect us with the world, to reconnect us at home, but to really propel us forward economically, scientifically, educationally, industrially into the 21st century. Viewers, this is LeVan Jones. He's actually become a legend in Oakland and now in the Bay Area. Infamous, infamous. Uh, well, yeah. hey, your statement. I'll, I'll, I'm going to strike that one. I'm That's just funny. Yeah. It's great to see you. Good to see you. Question, first of all. Yes, sir. Tell me about the original inspiration for this book. Because yeah. to us in the Bay Area, green technology and green environment are standard fare. Yeah. But that's not true for the rest of the country. Right, right. It's, it's, not, it's not true for folks in Tennessee where I grew up. It's not true for folks on the East Coast where I got my education. So, or in Texas uh, and undergraduate. Exactly. For me. So, yeah, 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 yeah. What was the inspiration? Did you well, wake up one day and just say, hey, you know You what? know, for me, honestly, it was, um, you know, I've been working, you know, too hard, working on issues around, you know, 
police brutality, right. working on issues around prison reform, right. juvenile justice reform, violence, well violence the in streets. the community, exactly. Right. Right. And I just frankly started trying to go to some meditation centers and doing some kind of strange you know, I wonder stuff. How you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And um, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, what's this salad? Oh, you know, what's this tofu? You know, and I started learning about all this kind of green, healthy lifestyles and solar panels and hybrid cars and I'm saying to myself, why don't we have this in the hood? You know, we yeah. we you know we need uh, you know good food and clean air as much as anybody else. And I started thinking, how do we bring some of the positive stuff from you know these other communities into our community? And frankly, bring some of the liveliness and soulfulness from our community out to, uh, to other folks as well. You reference and, West Oakland a lot. Yeah, sure. I yeah, sure. West, West Oakland is, is a place I, I did a lot of work, uh, especially with young people. Mm -hmm. And I, um, you know, I finally came, you know, came to the point where I said I want to write a book that shows how we can fight pollution and poverty at the same time with uh, green jobs. If we, if we really take our solar industry to scale, take our wind industry to six scale, so we, we're making energy not by burning stuff, but by building stuff, then you know, we can actually uh, uh, bring down asthma rates, bring down global warming, uh, and also bring up jobs and bring up hope. And so that has been something I've been passionate about, something I've been focused on. People are like, you know, you're a black guy, and it's kind of strange for, for, for African American. Don't yeah. you get tired of that stuff? Yeah, it's kind of, I, I, it's like you we know all, what? Uh, yeah, never mind. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah but, but you know, we're, you know uh, uh, green is all colors, you know. Right. This, this, that's my point. You know, green, green is all colors, and uh, you know, our, our big hope as we go forward is that increasingly we can expand this coalition that's looking for climate solutions, that's looking for ways to preserve um, our, our only home that we have, this little green soap bubble that we call Earth, um, and have you know, more and more people involved. So that's why I decided to do the book. The book is called The Green Collar Economy. It's how one solution can solve our two biggest <laughs> problems, which is environmental destruction and our economy being a free fall. the bullet train from New York to DC. It always brings me back to when I first started making this commute. In 2019, I was a freshman in the most diverse Congress in history. Up to that point, it was a critical time. I'll never forget the children in our community. They were so inspired to see this new class of politicians who reflected them navigating the halls of power. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet and that we had all the technology to do it. But people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. 10 years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create doubt and denial about climate change. It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing. And it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking like there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. 
it took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 years left to cut our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything. How we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. The only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people and most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remembered that as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression, World War II. We knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The wave began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and then the Senate and the White House in 2020, and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the federal jobs guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, the biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves with the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit Southern Florida, parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stopped being so scared of the future. We stopped being scared of each other, and we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too, and in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, riding that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us. And the first big step was just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see. Prayer of Commitment and Commissioning. 
in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Creating and life-giving God, you have placed us on earth and in connection with all of creation. Mother Earth, who sustains us, gives us life and beauty, and who now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted upon her. We pray that we will be filled with a spirit of concern for the future of our environment. Help us to be aware of your presence in the natural world around us and commit ourselves to caring for all of life on this fragile earth. Give us the grace to be able to bring an end to the exploitation of the Earth's scarce resources. We commit ourselves to love and support one another in the shared work of caring for the environment, that others in generations to come may always see your handiwork in the sky, water and land. We commit ourselves to live as responsible stewards, protecting and respecting this gift of creation God has placed in our hands. In the name of the one through whom all things came into being, our Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.